What a balmy situation, you know. The secular believe in the supernatural more than the religious. You know, I can recount either the um, children's home, uh, children's uh, storybook to um, Christians, and I get almost a dead response of uh, not really believing it, you know. Um, and yet a secular person, well, not so secular actually, um, but anyway, not someone who feels she's Christian, is met by an angel when she's 10 years old, meets her in her bedroom. And, um, I mean, she's lost her mum at something like the age of four. And uh, she's got a younger brother who she's semi-being mum to, even at the age of, you know, teen teenager. And uh, her dad drinks too much and a minor. And she has an angel visit her just next to her bed suddenly in the night. And uh, doesn't say anything, but, well, I mean, I say an angel. She said, uh, the lady, beautiful, absolutely, utterly beautiful woman in white, white, all white. The whole thing was white. And uh, she doesn't speak, but she's holding her arms forward as if she's holding something a hand, in her hands. And uh, it's just, and I thought, well, it's as if she's giving her a present. And, uh, of course, as she goes to go, um, my friend uh, wants to follow her instantly, pressing to follow her. But she goes behind the door, which is open, I think that's right, behind the, no, behind the door anyway, but through the wall. And of course my friend can't follow, she bangs into the wall, um, which wakes her dad up and so on. But, uh, you know, she so wants to follow. But she, the angel looks back and says, um, you can't follow yet. Something like that. You know, and other people hear this and, and they're not sure. And it's me, I hear it. And, oh, yes, you know. And a uh, chap in the room who is really secular. I mean, he's into meditation, but he's secular. Um, he believes it too. And just think, what a bizarre situation. The world believes in miracles, and the church doesn't. I don't mean all the church, of course. Some very earnest believers that very much believe in miracles, but they only believe in certain types of miracles that fit in with their theology, of course. Otherwise, it must be an evil spirit or, or just make-believe. So it's dismissed. Whether it's Buddhist or Christian or anything else, complicated ways of coping with life. Nearly all of them are covered by simply practicing thankfulness. We're talking today, a Buddhist chap friend of mine was chatting to us, giving us a meditation and talk. Well, talk because we asked questions to tease things out of him. But um, someone said to him, said, oh, well, uh, how are we supposed to increase our compassion? My view instantly was, well, well, I think compassion probably f comes quite simply from a thankfulness. If you're thankful for the good things, then you're happy and you're full and you're you're wealthy in spiritual sense. You you feel full and ready to help others. And if they're suffering, well, you're not going to ignore it. You want to sympathize. You understand. You, you try to visualize. Oh my goodness, poor soul's coping with sensor. And then you might want to exercise compassion in that you're willing to continue 
considering their problem until it becomes significant, imp imp important to you that you need it. And there's no point in doing this if you can't do anything to help because you'll just be left with the need to help but no way of satisfying it. But if there's a possibility of helping, then you create the need, you create the compassion by simply holding with the concern. The concern starts to bear on you and you think, how can I be happy if this person's suffering in this way? How can we help them? So it's best not to do this if you can't help them in any way, but if there's a possibility of it, well, you start to find out the more you think about it and the more your um, uh, sympathy is allowed to linger and your compassion grow. In other words, you take on a need that you didn't have before and uh, this need then is going to cost you. But you don't mind because your pleasure is in meeting needs. It's a wonderful joy when you've got someone who needed help and you're instrumental in contributing towards that help. That's just wonderful, isn't it? So, how do you increase your compassion? The same way as you increase your, your hope and uh, the trust and the faith that comes arises from that and the peace and the joy. You simply practice thankfulness to God especially for all that is good. And you overflow with an optimism and a, a cheerfulness and a wealth uh, of spirit that can take the difficulties, in fact, can suddenly see many of the difficulties for what they are, quite trivial. Nothing that you'll be that concerned about, you know, in a few weeks' time or a few years' time. I'm tempted to say there is no spiritual lack that can't be overcome by practicing thankfulness. All the addictions in the world, the more thankful you are, the God has somehow rescued you, even by giving you the addiction to meet the need temporarily until you find a better way of meeting it, perhaps, or the need itself just evaporates. Evaporates in a thankfulness to God, a satisfaction, a contentment that doesn't have this need that's driving the uh, addiction or personality disorder or anger or depression or uh, guilt or um, blame. The four things, according to uh, Marshall Rosenberg, nonviolent communication, what are the needs? Four needs are f um, no, the f sorry, not the four needs. The four responses to your needs are anger, depression, blame, guilt. They arise from your needs not being met. And they are the root uh, cause of violence. They are a violence to your peace and well-being and prosperity. Well, of course, I can overcome all four of these simply by practicing gratitude to God, thankfulness to God. Whatsoever is good and lovely, think on these things, thank God for it. And those that are not so good, you'll start to trust God for and be able to thank him for, even though you can't see the way in which they're going to be a blessing. You don't need to see. You choose to trust. This is how we know you are of God, by your faith. You choose to trust in your heavenly Father. Wow. You're more than on track, aren't you? Thank you, Dad. Well, I'm not sure how this ties in with the first part of this recording. 
where I'm talking about the Christians very often their ability to accept mirac miraculous and the supernatural um, because they've become too much part of the modern world I suppose in some way um, too dependent on their own reason and understanding and limited experience as opposed to the imagination of a more simpler people or even children come to that. But anyway, it is a great miracle that so many of the spiritual problems, well, I could almost argue, arise out of a state of not being filled with gratitude to God. If you are filled with gratitude, gratitude and you're full of hope, and your trusting increases at a phenomenal rate, in other words, your faith grows, your love of God grows, of course, your love of others grows, because they're less of a cost to you, because you're so wealthy in spiritual terms. You can take a few knocks, no problem. You become invulnerable, you see, you're protected, you're shielded, you're under his covering. Just the thought of an infinite God is an infinite covering and blessing and provision. Wow. Thank you, Dad. I should add that when the, um, my friend saw the angel at the age of 10, um, she was filled with an overwhelming presence of love that has lasted her all her life. She has never felt alone since then. I think, or I suggested to her today, that that was the present that the angel brought her. Whether that was the symbology in the arms being forward, as if holding something, as if giving something. I'm not sure, but I suggest it's possibly the case. Um, she was going through this, uh, my prompting, um, because she has felt, um, I'm going to read from my experience more recently of an overwhelming presence that gave her a peace. Um, and she was reading today, this evening, of Krishnamurti talking about, um, he doesn't call it a presence, but this, um, well, this overwhelming presence that he has felt. He doesn't name such as a presence even a and certainly doesn't name it as God or an angel, but well, but a presence, quite honestly, he doesn't say it's that, but that is brief writings. My friend's got a book up, um, speaks of in a most, well, I would say poetic type language. Krishnamurti at his best. I'm not usually terribly impressed by Krishnamurti. I know some people are, but I suppose I'm repelled from by what I see as a, a very sad man. In fact, I find Buddhism to be an incredibly sad philosophy. I suppose because of the contrast to the one I have in which God is my Heavenly Father. And the religion of Buddhism, as you may know, has no God. Uh, possibly, I think, in error, as I've said elsewhere. Not actually in keeping the Buddha's 
stream of experience at all. But I was shooting the Buddha's desire to, um, or the, the Buddhic teaching desire to remove uh, the trash of religion in favor of the essence that seemed to matter to the writers, which was a concern for the suffering of all life. That they have come to see now the followers of Buddhism as inevitable. And, uh, well, of course it would be if you got rid of God, but I can't think of anything more awful than to be deprived of the presence of God, especially compared to having experienced Him. Uh, but most Buddhists, of course, have not experienced in their awareness the goodness of God. And so are just, um, as I see it, depressed, subdued following a practice, um, if they're earnest, of meditation that tries desperately to come to terms with a loneliness and an isolation that it more than preserves, but actually cultivates. I don't mean to be hard on Buddhism, of course, because... well, because... I feel its followers can be so incredibly earnest and sincere and amazingly wonderful people despite what I see as an appallingly negative view of reality. They mistakenly embrace as true reality. I think there are so few people that seem to appear to be enlightened Buddhas precisely because of this mistake, genuine mistake. Hmm. What occurs to me on a brighter note, thinking of my friend's experiences, of the overwhelming peace, of the presence of God or the overwhelming love of the presence of God's angel. I think what I gather from it is such an earnest desire to reach out to the abundance of such reality that I believe is to hand simply through the practice of thankfulness. Whatsoever is good and lovely, think on these things and thank God for it. As your so often return to continual practice and you will miraculously and speedily attain far more than what some most earnest followers of truth have actually found. If not more than such, all of such followers. I think there's no greater blessing than you practicing thankfulness. I think in a way the Christian religion, the evangelical earnest Christian religion, has opened such a door indirectly by trusting in atonement and the perfect sacrifice 
as a means by which whether justifiably or not, whether validly or not, they reach out in an absolute trust in God, despite the evil that they understand to be in the world. My view is, is different, you see, that yes, there is good and evil in the world, it's here to bless us. It presents as good and evil, but really there is only God and what God makes. And what he makes is all part of a magnificent overall, complete, endlessly complete endlessly being completed and growing. Perfection. Absolute perfection. Utterly beyond our comprehension. In dimensions we've no grasp of. In which God is or or, or such that's contained in God. And that we as persons like God are of the same character even. Substance, if you could call it substance, as such that he is. You may say this is an utterly fantastic belief. is what I want to believe. And it's serving me incredibly well. I'm flying spiritually in joy and happiness and fullness of life. I actually feel I have a hold on life eternal. You may say, well, you're utterly deluded. I would say, you couldn't be more wrong. I can't prove it to you, but I am the experience of it. And I say, now I want you to have the same too, and trust utterly that my understanding of God is that he will too have you experience such, and all life, without exception, and all the lives that he creates, indefinitely, into the infinite future. Our God is an awesome God, more importantly, he loves you, specifically and individually, you. And I mean love. I don't mean forces insists, requires of, demands of. I mean love. Absolute and utter blessedness and kindness and goodness. Our dad. Our dad can do anything. More importantly, does everything good. And there is no other. Without him there is no other. And we are his children by which I mean to impress upon you something of how much he loves and cares for us, of his faithfulness and integrity towards us, of his unutterable goodness, of which you and I share with him 
in the eternities of his understanding and realm and being at that. Thank you, Dad.